Ladies and gentlemen, ACDC. <laughs> To get me some kicks Now I want you ladies I shoot from the hip I was born with a stiff Stiff upper lip Look at are as enduring or as iconic as ACDC. The no-nonsense riff monsters have been dominating the world of arena rock for the last 30 years. Reinventing hard rock with a fistful of classic albums, despite tribulations that would have crushed lesser bands, ACDC are now a unique phenomenon. Welcome to the place where ACDC are at their best and where no other act can challenge them on the stage. ACDC, you'll see a big rock show, you'll hear loads of classic songs, hugely powerful, hugely heavy, uh, armor-plated uh, live music. The music was written to be played live, unlike most bands who, who, who work hard to create the best possible album they can, and then worry about how the hell they're going to reproduce this live. With ACDC, it almost seems as if the albums are just tokens to keep the live work going, rather than the other way around. Those songs sound as good live as they do on the album, they continue to do so. They've always been first and foremost a live band, they've been about entertaining audiences, about taking out on the road and just going crazy. It was kind of tame, wasn't it? There, was, there wasn't a lot going on musically. It was kind of like your prog rock, you got your disco, and kind of out of nowhere come these, out of the middle of nowhere, out the outbacks of Australia, which nobody really cared about in England, nobody thought about Australia. But there's this band, you know, this dirty band in Denim, they're drinking beer. And, you know, they were singing about loose women, they were singing about rock and roll, loud music, you know, Friday night, beer in it, large in it. And there they were, and everybody was a bit like, oh my lord, what is this? You know, conservative sort of society were quite shocked, I think, by what ACDC came about. For many people, nobody had heard or seen anything just like that at all. to listen to those songs live one last time. I don't believe that flame will ever be extinguished. They're absolutely peerless. They did what they did absolutely brilliantly, perfectly, really. <laughs>
face it, without ACDC, there would be nobody playing air guitar. They dictate the future of music. They are rock and roll. They are a much needed rock band, and they're just as relevant now as they ever have been. And uh, I, for certainly one, will go and see them every time. a glow-trotting rock monster that became ACDC lie in a band called the Velvet Underground. Not the famous American art rock ensemble, this Velvet Underground was a group formed in Sydney, Australia in the early 1970s by guitarist called Malcolm Young. By 1973, Malcolm was tired of his band's poppy formula and looking for a harder sound, recruited his younger brother Angus into a new band and christened it ACDC. I used to play in school in, in bands and things, or with a few friends. And Malcolm was playing around Sydney in little club bands. And then he just turned around one day and said, why don't me and you play together? And we're getting people that we want to play with, you know? Well, and uh, so it was mainly the two of us together. And uh, we just got people who, who fitted in well with us. Bond came about a month later well, or so. Yeah. So it all sort of fitted you know, pretty good. phenomenal guitarist despite his tender years, rehearsing with the band after school while still dressed in his uniform of shorts and a tie. His sister suggested that he wear the outfit for gigs as it was a distinctive if slightly unusual look and the trademark image of ACDC was born. Even today with Angus well into his 50s, the school uniform is still a key part of the band's charm. Well that was that from, from the first go. Yeah. yeah. My sister came on with that. What did you think about it? I thought it was, well, at the time, I thought, oh, what's this, you know? I've, but then, when I thought about it, and I thought, well, because um, Malcolm said to me, you know, we don't want to be in a, you know, just put an old run-of-the-mill band together, you know, a band that's just going to sort of uh, have nothing, nothing with it, you know? So he said, you know, it'd be good if, uh, you know, it'd be a good idea. So I said, he always picked me being the smaller one and said, All right, right you, <laughs> you, you have a go of it. I think in a way the whole school uniform thing that Angus Young has always worn is a bit of a gimmick, but it's part of rock folklore, it's sort of grown with the band, and really it sprang from reality because Angus, uh, Angus's older brother Malcolm, who of course is also in the band, and his even older brother George, who was in a band called the Easy Beats. Music's always been in the family, and Angus being the youngest of those three, wanted to be part of it. But Malcolm probably had in the back of his mind uh, he was in a band called the Velvet Underground, not the famous band of that name, but just happened to be called that as well. But he had in the back of his mind that he wanted to form a more, a more rocking, blues and boogie based band. And maybe he was just beginning to think that, well, hang on, my little brother Angus can play here. Let's get him in the band. Let's try him out. So Angus initially would, would be uh, rehearsing with ACDC, still wearing his school uniform. <laughs> School uniform is ludicrous. I mean, in, in rock and roll terms, anybody wearing school uniform is ludicrous. Rock and roll is meant to be about rebellion. It's not meant to be about, 
you know, wearing your school uniform. But then they tweaked it anyway. I mean, look at the Highway to Hell album cover. That's got, you know, this. It's a devil. Yeah, you know, he's got his little devil horns on. He's holding his his tail in his school uniform. It's kind of like. It's exciting. It is rebellious in that sense, but it is iconic, and uh, it has stood the test of time. Even now, as a as a man just close enough to draw in his pension, he still wears it, and he still looks kind of cool in it. soon found gigs in Sydney and built a hungry local following. The group's first singer, Dave Evans, provided vocals to their debut single, Can I Sit Next to You? They'd been playing with a guy called David Evans, who didn't have the image or the presence or the attitude to really front a band like ACDC. He probably wasn't really aware of what the band was going to become. It was only when Bon Scott joined that the, the band that we would sound, that we'd come to know as ACDC, became what it is. He was absolutely integral to it. to Melbourne in 1974 led to a shake-up in the band. Singer Evans left after a dispute at a concert and was replaced by their driver, Bon Scott. Scott, a man with feral on-stage presence and a voice that could melt loud speakers, was the ultimate frontman, living a genuinely rock and roll lifestyle and injecting the band's songs with tales of his own outrageous antics. Bon Scott was a brilliant front person, um, quite feminine and feline for all of his sort of butch masculine vocal prowess if you watch his performance he's actually quite he's very lean but he moves in quite a kind of feline way which is a really nice counterpoint to angus sort of doing his comedy duck walking across the stage um he wasn't a particularly mesmeric performer physically but his voice was was just incredibly commanding and i think that's what makes him a dynamic performer but he was a superb frontman. He was absolutely dynamic. He would just make the stage his own. He knew exactly what he was doing. He had this huge voice, uh, kind of a, like a more aggressive version of Robert Plant, really. He, had that, he could hit those high notes, but in a much more guttural way, um, particularly live. You know, he could really turn it on live. <laughs> was probably the first iconic rock and roll frontman um, born of the 70s. I mean, there's this chap, he's got his uh, tight denim jeans on with his uh, stick of broccoli down the front. He's got tattoos up his arms, big hairy chest, which, you know, the ladies liked in the 70s. And um, a very cheeky kind of nerd or smile and a look in the eye. And uh, ultimately, he was a very good frontman. I mean, he had all the uh, makings of a... Uh, Somebody that your parents wouldn't like, your, uh, the ladies would like, because he was a bit of a bad boy. And uh, he had the, the vocal cords to match as well. joined by 
by drummer Phil Rudd, formerly of the band The Coloured Balls, and bassist Mark Evans. The new lineup brought the band a much needed dose of musical expertise, as well as a hard living image thanks to Scott's criminal record for minor offences. Ironically, Malcolm and Angus, the cornerstones of the band, never really lived the life of rock and roll debauchery. Famously, they preferred playing Monopoly to raising hell after gigs. I don't think it's fair to say that ACDC were bad boys, although they did have that image and that probably that image was quite helpful to them, particularly in their formative years. They were seen as being from the wrong side of the tracks. They had songs like Problem Child and Bad Boy Boogie and Rocker, which seemed to address that kind of life. They were tapping into, um, I think, a sort of a working class ethic of uh, partying and drinking um, and just having fun. Um, there was nothing pretentious about them. The fact of the matter is, though, that ACDC weren't really into that aspect of the lifestyle. Once the new band was established, ACDC built a loyal Australian following on the back of two Australia-only albums, High Voltage and TNT, released in 74 and 75. A British and American tour followed the international release of a compilation from both albums, confusingly also titled High Voltage. ACDC were rapidly gaining a reputation for bad boy antics, largely thanks to their songs about loose women and loud music. This paved the way for the 1977 album Let There Be Rock, the first real ACDC classic, and also the first to feature new bassist Cliff Williams. kind of basically took everything that ACDC was already and just up the ante just that much to make a, an album full of classic songs. I mean, the first song on there, Go Down, is a, is a classic. The, the lyrics are hilarious, really. Bon Scott talking about getting blowjobs from ladies and who, who's good at licking his stick, you know. It's hilarious, really. Um, quite how PC it is, I'm not sure, but people thought it was quite cheeky I suppose and, and the way Bon Scott delivered it was quite cheeky as well I mean it wasn't wasn't uppity it didn't get people's backs up it was just it was slick really Bon Scott was having much more of an influence in the band his lyrics his personal stories were coming in um, and really you just had some really good songs on that album some of the songs that are still considered to be classics today the title track I mean Let There Be Rock for example is a live favourite and always will be there won't be a time when ACDC don't play that track live it's got everything you know and there's almost like a, a reverence for it you know the whole even the title Let There Be Rock is almost a quasi-religious reverence for it which the audience just gives back in spades um, so that's obviously a classic and it's, it's, it's helped ACDC to escalate to, be, to the status of gods of rock for that very same reason. On the train of pass, the rock and roll was born. And on the cross of the land, every rock and band was blowing up a song. And the control man got famous, the business man got rich. And every body was a superstar, with a simple image. And over 15 million fingers, learning how to play. This is what they had to say. Look at the light. Sound. Drums. Guitar. Wow, let me run. Oh, come on. Probably the, 
the most exciting and the best song on that album is the closing track, Whole Lot of Rosie. Um, that is a track inspired again by one of Bond's uh, lady friends on, on the larger side. And, uh, and that song is a classic. I mean, it's 20, 30 years old and uh, it is still played to death throughout the world whole lot of rosie it is the ultimate song it's got the ultimate riff in as well acdc riff <laughs> angus you know world millions of audiences all around the world hear that riff and they know what to do and that song is probably one of the uh, the classics on that album i want your story thing about ACDC is the fact that, that uh, and it might sound like a cliche, but they play the kind of music that transgresses age and gender and social mores, and I think that's, that's, that's a reason for their longevity, and arguably, of course, some of their, well, more than some, a large number of their songs are extremely dodgy, um, but it, it's really hard to deny the, the kind of plain, rocking, good time power of songs like Whole Lotta Rosie. Um, and, and I think that um, with the sort of hindsight, with you know, the benefit of hindsight, um, those songs are a lot less offensive than even they might possibly have been at the time. which is an absolute classic and still is. Um, enormous riffs from, from Angus Young, bravura vocal performance from, from Bon Scott. Um, again, they'll never stop playing that track. Yeah, it was just the moment when it all came together for ACDC and it, it, it launched them down the, down the runway, shall we say. <laughs> Powerage was better still, amping up ACDC's sound into a taut, take-no-prison set of killer tunes that some regard as their finest work to date. The band followed up this 1978 classic with a live album, If You Want Blood, You've Got It, which featured a blood-soaked Angus on the sleeve. By this stage, the raw energy of their live shows was becoming legendary, with fans flocking in their thousands to witness the riff spectacular that the band had honed to a fine art. With ACDC, even in the early years, it's always been about showmanship and power and entertainment. You know, that's been, that's been the main things those guys have done. Um, yes, the music's been very important, but they understand that you have to put on a show. Most bands in that time, that era, were concentrating too much on just playing the music well. Because in the 70s, you had to do that because you, you would stand or fall. On your, on your live show. ACDC, however, always were able to bring in something extra. You had Angus Young, he'd strut around the place, goose walking, doing all kinds of bizarre um, marches across the stage, of course wearing his school uniform outfit. And in total contrast to his brother Malcolm and, and, and Cliff Williams, who would stand at the back, almost out of the picture, only coming forward to bark out the backing vocals. Angus, was, it was as if he'd drunk a vat of sunny delight and was just ODing on a sugar rush. And also equally prominent, Bon Scott would be um, the, the, the tight jeans, he'd be sort of darting around the stage, grinning mischievously, shaking his head and so on. He'd carry Angus Young around on his shoulders, uh, just these little traditions that grew up and, and they'd, they'd never stopped doing. ACDC, despite being a bunch of, frankly, very ordinary looking guys, have always understood that you have to put on a rock show. And they obviously love it, and that's the reason why it works so well. Well, 
I mean, watching ACDC live is always, has always been, and always will be a phenomenal experience. It is a real entertainment. Before ACDC and, uh, and all through the 70s and stuff, there was this prog rock thing and disco music, and it was a very separate thing. There was a separation between the audience and the band and the musicians. Angus Young and ACDC just, they were like you and me. They were just people off the streets playing rock and roll music and doing what they wanted to do. I think the thing that, that distinguished ACDC from a lot of other um, acts uh, of sort of their peers and it um, is the fact that the scene they came from was, was the um, pub circuit in Australia which is a very sort of spit and sawdust hard working you earn your stripes kind of scene also the nature of the audiences that they would have been playing to on Australia as they worked their way to the top before they became a mega stadium sized act I think it's reflected in in the completely sort of unabashed sweaty physicality of their performance there's no uh, barrier uh, there's no sort of psychological barrier or very very small one between uh, the band on stage and the audience they're not posturing they're not preening they're not the peacocks they're a bunch of sweaty blokes rocking and rolling <laughs> Of ACDC in the 1970s was unstoppable. By now, Malcolm Young, the chief songwriter, had honed a formula which was simple and devastatingly effective. The best ACDC songs from those far off days consisted of a solid riff played in unison by two guitars and bass and a simple but rock hard drum pattern. To avoid complete overkill, Scott's vocals and Angus's lead guitar solos were distinctive and catchy, making the end product simply unforgettable. The beauty of ACDC's music is its simplicity. I mean, basically, it's rock and roll with a bit of boogie, boogie whatever you want to call it. Uh, guaranteed three chords, no more. Basic but hard rocking beats um, with vocals over the top, be it Bonds or Brian Johnson's, and uh, some tremendous guitar work by uh, Angus Young on top of it all. If you keep things simple, there's less chance of anything going horribly wrong. And that's basically what they've done for the last 30 years. But the way they play the guitars is, is simple, but it's so loud. There's so much power and volume in what they're actually putting out that it requires your singer, be it Bon Scott or Brian Johnson, to absolutely holler their guts out. So everything ACDC do, even, if, even though it is quite chunky, simple stuff, is incredibly powerful. And during the solos, of course, although, again, Angus isn't playing immensely elaborate, complex stuff, it's just so powerful that it, it just rips the roof off. I think a lot of people overlook the melodicism of ACDC songs as well, which was a kind of softening, a way of softening the songs, a way of, of um, uh, making sure that they didn't have just bludgeoning power and nothing else. So they're extremely melodic, melodic it, it, with almost a pop sensibility, as well as rocking very hard and being riff heavy um, and, and allowing Angus a lot of room to, to play around. A good example of the effectiveness of the no-nonsense ACDC formula came with the title track of the next album, Highway to Hell, a sing-along classic which has rocked stadium crowds for decades. 
John Scott was at the peak of his form and the record made number 17 in America, a key breakthrough in that important but fickle rock market. It's a revealing sign of the impact of ACDC that they could sell so many albums at a time when punk and disco were at their commercial peak. ACDC finally broke the American market for the same reason that any overseas band finally breaks the market, through being very, very good and very, very committed. They basically toured themselves to death in America, and they had a really strong album in Highway to Hell to back that up. It was produced by Mutt Langer, who was also to produce the famous Back in Black album. Way to Hell for me is one of my favourite albums. I always remember as a kid seeing the album cover with Angus Young with his little devil horns holding his his devil's tail between his legs on the front of the cover and thinking, oh my lord, is this man the, the Antichrist or something? And as a small kid, I was kind of, kind of shocked and horrified and also quite intrigued about what this album was all about. I remember buying it and uh, it's got some good tracks on Beating Around the Bush. Uh, Highway to Hell, the actual track itself, is, is a massive favourite still to this day. I mean, that came out in, what, 78? And um, it's a fantastic song. It's, it's a very anthemic song, which is one of ACDC's good qualities. Um, they've got a good chorus that you can uh, sing along with to, you can punch in the air to. just bought into the live work they were doing, the touring ethic. They could actually buy this album, Highway to Hell, and they can go and see this band, ACDC, and actually play the thing note for note, you know. They sounded as good live as they did on the record, perhaps even better. There was a kind of a working class, blue collar ethic there, which some people bought into, middle America bought into that. There were a lot of rather pretentious bands around in the late 70s who would spend an awful lot of time playing elaborate solos and complex stuff. A lot of them seemed very pampered and complacent, didn't want to break out into a sweat on stage. ACDC, of course, were the complete opposite of that. They were just, I've never actually seen a man sweat as much as Angus Young. I'm, I'm serious, I mean, you, you worry about the guy. The sweat literally, literally, pour, literally pours from his head. That's why he's so small, I guess. He just he uses so much weight every time he goes out on stage. He never puts on any weight. So ACDC would do this because they loved it and, and, and because they, they were able to um, tie into this sort of working class thing that was going on. country where if you work hard you reap the rewards and people are glad that you have you know they're glad that you've become successful ACDC went out there they toured their asses off and uh, their basic rock and roll songs captured the hearts of uh, everybody in America and uh, they sold a lot of millions of records over there. Being around the bush. In the 1970s, ACDC were on top of the world, playing to huge audiences, selling millions of albums and recording some of the best music of their career to date. However, their world was shattered on February the 20th, 1980, when Bon Scott suddenly died. Official reports stated that he'd drunk himself to death, but some uncertainty still surrounds the tragic events to this day. 
Few fans were surprised at the manner of Scott's passing as he was infamous for his debauched lifestyle, but all were shocked at the event. Bon Scott died under the, the mysterious, dubious circumstances of too much alcohol thrown in a car to uh, sleep it off and uh, ultimately died on his own vomit. Um, and then somebody found him in the morning. Um, it's very sad, very tragic. Almost expected for somebody who had such a hedonistic rock and roll lifestyle, you know. Um, it, it's almost impossible to imagine how a band would replace somebody as pivotal to their sound as Bon Scott. They lost this, this front man who was so important to them, who was an incredible, awesome front man, uh, who owned, totally owned the stage and who the fans related to perhaps more than anybody else in the band. So Bon Scott's death was an absolute catastrophe for ACDC and, and, and many were amazed that they even considered carrying on. going to be a, a, a terrible um, moment of will they still manage it when a very high profile strong front person or indeed any member of the band um, passes away um, more so with ACDC possibly because of course his voice was was so much a part um, of the band's sound but uh, I think it's hard to imagine that the band could have done better than hire Brian Johnson I mean I, I know at the time there was a lot of, um, he will never be as good. In fact, he was just as good vocally, um, a less commanding front person live, um, but, but vocally, absolutely 100%, 110% replacement fine. Phone call. They wouldn't say who it was, you know, they just said, I'm sorry, we can't tell you who it is because of the fact that there's been a bereavement in the band and we don't really think it's time to let anybody know you know who the band is. I've never been for an audition in my life, you know, I, just, I, just, I, can't, I can't go to London, you know, I can't afford it. <laughs> you really couldn't afford to go down to London? No, no, I was uh, broke. I was very lucky, I had a good friend who, uh, who lent us his car, and as soon as I walked in, it was like a real friendly atmosphere. Uh, they just said, oh, hello, and had a can of brown ale waiting for us. You know, the news from Newcastle, and can of brown ale. Uh, yeah, come on, we know you might be nervous. And well, I was that like, tired? I was like, knackered. I wasn't, I wasn't nervous. I was just saying, hey, let's do it. I've got to get, got to get back. I've got a gig tomorrow. <laughs> Bon Scott and Brian Johnson are kind of similar, they're kind of worlds apart as well. I mean, Brian Johnson was from, uh, is it Geordie? I mean, he comes along in his little vest and his flat top and he hasn't changed for the last 20 odd years. I mean, he's got a more of a shrill to his voice that Bon Scott had. Bon Scott was a bit more creamy, a bit more soulful. Um, still not the, you know, the best singer in the world, quite raspy and, um, Brian Johnson kind of just extens extenuated that raspiness and slightly shrilly, um, which also came across in his uh, live show as well. Live, if you look at the two, Bond was always upright, kind of swaggered around like the, he owned the stage. Whereas Brian Johnson comes along, he's a bit squat and um, kind of just hunches up a little bit more and relies more on looking down when he when he screams a lot more which is kind of interesting you know it's like mm. the confidence of Bon on one hand so you know Brian Johnson is confident but just takes it in a different direction to say he's a singer would be 
wrong. You know, the guy squeals, he squawks, and uh, somehow managed to reach reaches some notes that resemble tunes. But uh, I mean, ultimately, that's what it's all about. It's about rock and roll. It's about working and coming from the streets and having a go and straining those vocal cords just like the punk rockers did as well you know the punk movement of the 70s it's that whole thing you know anybody can do this and uh, Brian Johnson would probably admit that he's no singer but he does the job well for the music that he is providing vocals for <laughs> We did an album, it sold heaps and heaps and heaps, you know, right around the world and countries that I've never heard of, you know. And uh, I think the band itself's an honest, hard working band, you know, they, they try the hardest to give the best value for money. I'd never been to America in my life until I joined DC. And the first gig we did there, we you know, straight into Madison Square Garden. And you know, just before I went on stage, I promptly got thrown out by the security, wondering what a bum like me was doing, hanging around <laughs> Madison Square Garden. I mean, it was sold out, it was packed, and I couldn't get back in. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the chauffeurs who took me there spotted us, and he put us in the back of the limo, and he, he, he drove us back in again. <laughs> Johnson's first album with ACDC, a classic for the band. Back in Black went on to be recognised as one of the finest rock albums ever released. It subsequently sold over 10 million copies in America alone, a vast achievement which points directly at the excellence of the songs such as the title track and the all-time classic anthem, You Shook Me All Night Long. This album ushered ACDC into their commercial peak, the early 1980s, which saw them tour and record as one of the biggest bands on the planet. If you were to only be able to buy one ACDC album, Back in Black would definitely be the one to buy. It's quintessential, diamond-studded ACDC. The remarkable thing about Back in Black, and there are so many remarkable things about it, uh, first and foremost, it's incredible sales figures. Last year, the album was certified to have sold 21 million copies in the United States alone. And it has been said that it has sold a total of 42 million copies worldwide, which actually makes it not merely the biggest rock album of all time, but the second biggest album of all time, second only to Michael Jackson's Thriller. Uh, it's almost impossible to believe, but it, any way you slice it, even if those figures aren't quite correct, Back in Black is an enormous uh, achievement. It's, it is a monster of sound. <laughs> and Mutt Langer was hugely important to them, plus their songwriting was bang on, Hell's Bells, you know, uh, the high voltage rock of shoot to thrill, and You Shook Me All Night Long, which pretty much is ACDC's most immediately memorable song. Their first real bite at the, uh, the big chorus uh, anthem was uh, Rock and Roll Damnation, which was, which, was a, which was a hit single, but You Shook Me All Night Long took that format and, and made it even better. It's probably ACDC's most sing-along album. I mean, Back in Black, You Shook Me All Night Long, still very popular now. I mean, that is such a sing-along ACDC song. It wasn't the band recreating the past. It was a band 
looking at what they've done before, got a new front man in, and just up in the ante with themselves. ACDC maintained the incredible momentum they gained from Back in Black for three years, releasing the excellent For Those About to Rock, We Salute You, which was number one in America. For Those About to Rock, which came, it was the second album featuring uh, Brian Johnson. And as a title track, it, it's, it's an anthem that still you can celebrate now. I mean, it's got cannon fire in the middle of it, which is great live because they play that song live and you know, for those about to rock fire. I just whacked the microphone, sorry. <laughs> It's always an extremely fine line between, between humour and parody. And I think ACDC just understand where that line is. And arguably having a, a wheel-mounted cannons, one on either side of the stage, for, for those about to rock, we salute you, is tipping into parody. But I think, I think, they, I think their self-awareness um, uh, carries them through. And, and also, I think... Essentially, they like to have a laugh. They like to have a good time. And if that involves pyrotechnics and cannons, so be it. those cannons from nowhere and it's all about the, ca the cannons on the album cover and live they just have this 21 gun salute as it says you know and you've got all these cannons firing off in the middle of that song and for a rock band to do that it's just it's the ultimate anthem isn't it for those about to rock fire poof, we salute you i should join acdc but ultimately it's there it's, it's just a fantastic song um, and bands don't write anthems like that anymore. It's not there anymore. Anth th anthemic rock, you know, who does it better than ACDC? No one. <laughs> drummer Rudd with Simon Wright, they then recorded Flick of the Switch, releasing it in 1983. <laughs> Switch, when I bought the album, it's pretty rubbish. I mean, the band don't really play anything as far as I'm aware off that album. I mean, Bedlam in Belgium, what sort of, what were they on about? You know, it's just like a rubbish album. I mean, the sleeve was all white. It had a little Angus 
flicking a switch and I remember it being embossed and it was quite exciting because it was an embossed album sleeve but I mean the embossedness of the album was probably the most exciting thing of that record I've played it about three times it was just rubbish and the problem was I think that the band had certainly peaked with their success their commercial success and also the post Bon era had kind of plateaued as well the first two albums yeah, the first album, Back in Black, people were excited that the band had got a new singer. With For Those About to Rock, the band had continued and proved that Brian was a no one-hit wonder with the band. But by the time Flick of the Switch came, it was a bit, uh, yeah, didn't really... This song sang about rubbish things. It wasn't very interesting. Um, the novelty had maybe worn off a little bit. And that kind of continued for the band's career for a while. <laughs> to late 80s, ACDC's album sales declined drastically. However, all things should be put into context. Every album they've released has sold at least one million copies. So yeah, I mean, compared to selling 40 million copies of Back in Black, it's a disaster. But 99.9% .9 of bands out there would sell their grandmother for the opportunity to sell at least a million copies of every album they produce, no matter how bad they are. So um, Flick of the Switch and Fly on the Wall didn't sell any more than a palace of a million, which is regarded as a failure in ACDC terms. But they retained, very importantly, their lifeblood, um, the core of their fan base, the hardcore, if you say, uh, if you like, of ACDC's fan base. So they still made successful albums. They still played big shows. Um, they weren't doing anything like as well as they were with Back in Black and on Highway to Hell. Those were about to rock. Those days were, in, were seen to be in the past, but they may have been seen to be treading water at this time. But I mean. Most bands, as I say, we would kill to tread water as successfully as ACDC did. of hiatus followed for Malcolm Young and his troops. The 1980s were not kind to many once great rock acts. The era of the Fairlight Sampler and the New Romantic Movement didn't sit well with the blue collar approach and songs about books and females that sat at the heart of ACDC's music. To the band's credit, they never tried to water down their music or pander to current trends, remaining true to themselves despite considerable industry pressure not to do so. I think any band that has, has reached that sort of um, and uh, that's those sort of dizzying heights, um, enjoying a number one album in America at a time when um, you're running counter to the temper of the times, really, and your music is, is, is really quite Neanderthal in comparison, and you haven't absorbed any new technology at all, you haven't employed syndromes or synthesizers or any, other, uh, any of the other things that were happening in technology at the time, you're bound to, if not suffer from a dip in fortunes, stasis is going to set in you're not going to going to be able to add any you're not going to be able to increase your audience the best you can do is make uh, you know you're just going to have the same fan base really <laughs> Yeah. 
sex, drugs and rock and roll. That's what ACDC are. And it almost became a bit passe um, towards that sort of middle 80s grain. It was a bit passe to sing about sex, drugs and rock and roll. They'd exhausted the cannons and the whole anthem, anthem rock. You know, it had all become hit ahead, I think. And I think they were struggling trying to find what to write about. They were struggling with their identities of what, ACDC meant to people I mean rock music was going through changes music was going through changes there was new new bands coming out new technologies and people just were a bit unexcited about this band with a man in his school uniform it had just become passe and a bit boring ACDC's sound has changed over the years although I think it should be stated their sound hasn't changed anything like as much as some bands have but inevitably you lose someone as important as Bon Scott it's never going to be exactly the same again. I don't just mean because of the sound of the vocals. Brian Johnson doesn't sound anything like Bon Scott vocally, but it's, it's more than just that. Um, bon Scott was a significant writer for the band. His, his lyrics, his personal stories, his bawdy tales, shall we say, of, of drinking and womanizing and so on, which, which, which ACDC's early material is characterized by. They tried to uh, continue in that vein, but it wasn't quite the same. And Brian Johnson has written for the band, but he is clearly a very different influence to, to Bon Scott. And indeed, there was uh, a couple of albums in which Brian Johnson didn't contribute anything at all because he was off doing other things. And the Youngs, um, Angus and Malcolm, became more and more of the prevailing influence, shall we say. It was no longer a partnership between them and, and Bon Scott. It was, this was Angus Angus and Malcolm Young's band end of, to the point of at which they started to produce their own albums. After Back in Black, they, um, well, eventually they got rid of Muttle Langer's services and they actually produced uh, two albums, at least two albums by themselves, uh, which is where it all started to go a bit wrong. One critic said they made the same album nine times, which is fine if the music's good, but it was starting to sound a little bit stale. The format was fairly similar. They hadn't deviated too much away from that, but, after an album like Back in Black, there's only one way to go, unfortunately, and it is downhill. In 1990, a new appreciation of rock music began to make itself felt. Fans were beginning to look back at icons of years gone by, and ACDC capitalised on this by releasing their best album in years, The Razor's Edge. ACDC scored a significant coup in 1995 when renowned producer Rick Rubin worked with them on a new album, Ball Breaker. More tours followed, and ACDC's most recent album, Stiff Upper Lip, was a success in the year 2000. Well, I was out on the drive on a bit of a trip, looking for thrills to give me some kicks. Now I want to be ladies, I shoot from the hip. I was born with a stiff, stiff upper lip. Lock it down, In relatively recent years, ACDC's output has slowed down dramatically to the point at which their last album was actually released in 2000, which now seems a very long time ago. Um, but I think what those albums have done is, is sustained the legend. They had to put something out in that time, otherwise it would purely be about nostalgia for ACDC, in which no band wants that to be the case. The Ball Breaker was a solid album. It kept ACDC going during that kind of very lean time in the, in the mid-90s when the whole rise of grunge and alternative rock had actually strangled some classic rock bands out of existence altogether. Stiff Upper Lip, however, in, in 2000 was a comeback of sorts. That sold more, and they actually had a number one hit single in America with the title track. Um, so this clearly was not a band in decline. Stiff Upper Lip came out in 2000 and, you know, by then it was kind of like, oh great, a new ACDC album, but 
it's pretty much like the old one, you know, the other ones that they've just done before that. Most people don't really know, and it's only the diehards that will go and listen to it, but they're hardly uh, memorable songs. You know, arguably any band only ever has one set of, of you know, it has a, has a kind of maximum number of riftastic songs, and maybe if they've just previously packed a bunch of riftastic songs onto an album, they need to go around way and write some more. But they're a live drawer, essentially. They, they put on an amazing show. And there are a lot of bands like that. Um, you could say the same thing about Van Halen in the, you know, as well, for example. You're not going to buy their records, but you might well be drawn to go and see them live for the experience. It's extraordinary. The beauty of ACDC, even with their commercial, when they went beyond their commercial heights of success, they were still a great live band. And the good thing about ACDC is they deliver the goods every time you go and see them. You want to see a show, you want to see Angus, you know what to expect with ACDC. It's like you go to the pub and you expect a good pint, you know, you know what you're going to get with ACDC, you know that you're going to get a whole lot of Rosie, you'll know you'll get all your classics, even if you, you know, we can forgive them for a few duff records, we can forgive any band for a few duff records, as long as they don't play too many of those songs live. You go and see ACDC live and you'll get a good show. And that was the, that's what kept the band going. They became... OK, well, the albums aren't great, but we know that they're good live and we'll still go and see them live, and they will still be totally on the ball. I do feel as if they're probably gearing up to one last album and um, one last big celebratory world tour. That said, uh, rock and roll has a habit of getting into your blood, and it may well be that the, these guys just genetically are incapable of actually going into retirement or understanding the meaning of that. They clearly still love what they do. Um, they don't want to stop. They just want to make this next album as good as it can possibly be. 